So the story you're going to hear tonight is the story that Eileen never really wanted to tell, but through her own personal experience, she wants to reveal the troubling reality of drug addiction in high-pressure, white-collar professions such as law, finance, startups, and technology. Eileen Zimmerman details her family's tragedy and discovers all that it has yielded for us to learn about this topic. She has been a journalist for three decades, covering business, technology, and social issues for a wide array of national magazines and newspapers. She was also a columnist for the New York Times Sunday Business section for six years, and since 2004 has been a regular contributor to the newspaper. In 2017, Eileen Zimmerman also began pursuing a master's degree in social, social work, and she now lives in New York City. Please help me welcome Eileen Zimmerman. Hi, thank you for coming tonight to hear me. So um, I thought I would, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the story that I wrote and why I wrote it, and then do three short readings from the book. But I'll set each one up um, so that they're they make sense and they're in context. And then after that, I can take any questions that you have. So this book, Smacked, was written. <clears throat> after I found my ex-husband Peter had died on the floor of his house in this very posh beach community in Southern California. Um, I had come up to his house because he'd been really sick, he'd been acting bizarrely, um, behaving, speaking incoherently, texting incoherently, and he'd also been absent. He missed all our son's cross-country meets for junior year. He left us early at my daughter's a college drop-off. He said he had to go back to the office for an emergency. <clears throat> he was always late to pick him up. He was late to everything. But he always had an excuse, and his excuse was almost always work, um, which made sense because he was a very high-power lawyer in a very um, prestigious law firm that's based in Silicon Valley, and he worked in San Diego. And so we couldn't reach him for two days after he'd been really sick. <clears throat> and I drove up to his house thinking, I'm going to take him to the hospital and that's gonna be the end of this craziness. And I got there and I found that he had died. <clears throat> and there were, um, and in my shock, uh, I just focused on his body and trying to do chest compressions and, you know, get him to wake up, but, but he wasn't going to. And all around me <clears throat> was drug paraphernalia. There were syringes on the sink. One had just been used. One was kind of ready to go. There was a white powder on the stereo speakers that he had in the bathroom. There were safes that were open and just spilling out bottles and bottles of pills. Just the fact that there were safes. There were tourniquets and scales and little tiny spoons and all kinds of <clears throat> drug and medical paraphernalia that I did not even see. All I saw was him on the floor and I noticed that he had one small hole above his elbow. And the only thing that struck me about that was that the injury looked so round. And I thought, well, that's weird. But that was it. And it wasn't until the medical examiner came and said, I think he died of an overdose, that I was like, what? Like, I was like, what are you talking about? He went to Cornell. He's a lawyer. He lives here. He's rich. <clears throat> and she was like, yeah, you know, we actually, we see this a lot more than you would think right now. And she was just talking about... San Diego County. <clears throat> she wasn't talking about nationally, so I thought, if she's seeing more of it in San Diego County, I'm sure that it, people are seeing it all over the country. And <clears throat> so, at the time, I knew there was a story there, but I couldn't do anything about it because my whole family was in crisis, and I was in crisis. And I spent the next um, year and a half settling Peter's estate. He hadn't paid his taxes in years. His house was a mess. He just accumulated all kinds of stuff, either that he bought when he was high or just bought because he was not feeling well and it was just kind of another addiction. <clears throat> and the house hadn't been kept up in four years and it was right by the ocean, so it was rusting and there were lots of things to do. So I was really preoccupied with that, but at the same time, I felt this real need to try to understand what happened to him because I missed everything. So I started to piece together things like texts from drug dealers. I laid out all the pills he had that I could find in the house, and I tried to identify all of them. Some I did, some I couldn't. I tried to piece together <clears throat> the timings of bank withdrawals 
on certain nights with where he said he was supposed to be when he was supposed to say, pick up our son from high school or be with him that night. And I would see that it would line up that those would be the nights that my son would say, dad said he was going out to get a soda at a <clears throat> gas station a mile away and he would get back four hours later and my son would say, where's the soda? And Peter would say, oh, I forgot. So like things, like, or he'd be in the house, like he's a high school kid after practice, after cross country practice, and there was no food in the house and there was like no plan for dinner. It's like he stopped being a dad and he would just sleep all the time. And I learned from his boss that he stopped showing up at work, that his work was very subpar. <clears throat> for some reason, his boss, a partner he worked with, so a colleague, but also the managing director of the firm, showed up at Peter's house about an hour after he died. He said a neighbor called him. You know, I don't know how likely that is, or if he had somebody watching the house and suspected that something was gonna happen, but he was there. And one of the things he said was that Peter would be on conference calls with clients and would start going off on tangents. And I remember he said, we were having a meeting <clears throat> about like a, an acquisition, one big pharma company, like, you know, maybe buying another smaller one. And Peter started talking about really good deals online shopping. <laughs> and I, I think that Jeff, his boss, was like, um, okay, but, you know, let's get back to this matter. And he was saying, like, it just didn't make sense. And that he kind of stopped coming in. And so from that, I investigated. And, um, and about six months after Peter died, the American Bar Association in conjunction with Hazelden Betty Ford, the treatment center, did a study of lawyers across the country, 13,000 of them, and asked them about their drinking and drug use. So it turned out lawyers had very high levels of drinking, much higher levels of problem drinking than the general public. But two thirds of them had skipped over the questions on drugs. They hadn't, hadn't even answered them on an anonymous survey. And the lead investigator of the study, this guy Patrick Krill from Hazelden at the time, I said, do you think it's because they're not using them? And he said, no, I think they're afraid to answer. I think they are using them. And so I started down an investigative reporting path and came out with a piece in 2017 in the New York Times that was titled, The Lawyer, The Addict. And that was about um, what happened to Peter as a lawyer and then what was going on in the legal profession, how <clears throat> excuse me, law students will start law school actually healthier than the average student their age. And three years later, when they get out of law school, they have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and substance use, and alcoholism, alcohol being a substance. Um, and so there was a lot of research done about that, and some of that is due to the pedagogy of law school. But So there's this like nature-nurture argument. So are the people that are attracted into the law naturally negative? Because positive psychology teaches us that a negativity mindset is almost never an asset, never helpful in life except in the law. In the legal profession, if you are negative, you are a better lawyer. You are always looking for the hole, the thing missing, the mistake. So you're attracting people that are like that anyway. Maybe they're not the sunniest personalities in the world and they come with a predisposition to, to depression and anxiety and <clears throat> you add to that the chronic stress of law school, the Socratic method, all those things, intense competition for grades and good summer associate positions. And by the end of law school, you have a lot of depressed, high drinking, you know, drugging human beings that are going to go now practice law. And then they get into law and it gets harder and more tense and more stressful. And it just builds and builds and builds on itself. So after that <clears throat> piece in the New York Times, I got a ton of mail, a lot of email from people, a lot of lawyers writing to me saying, I'm a young associate at such and such a firm and I don't want to wind up like Peter, but I think I'm going to. People talking to me about the drugs they were using. And I heard from a lot of spouses and ex-spouses about what had happened in their families. And some of the stories were really devastating. Some were very similar to mine. Some were not quite as devastating. So I realized it touched a chord. That story had about two million shares, which I never expected. I don't know if you read the Sunday Times, but I generally go right to the style section, and this was the business section, so, um, so it struck a nerve. And I decided from that to write this book, which was a closer examination of exactly what happened to Peter and me trying to figure that out, and then an examination of what's going on in white-collar professions like law, finance, technology, medicine, where you have people that 
the stakes are very high. There's a lot of money at stake. They have a lot of education. And um, there's a lot of prestige. And there's also a ton of pressure and stress. And then I looked a little bit at what was coming for the next generations, the youngest millennials and the oldest Gen Zs. So we're talking about people that are maybe 20 to 26 or 27, maybe 30, who are now becoming the next white collar professionals of the future, the lawyers, the judges, the doctors, the technologists. And, um, and I found some you know, very disturbing information. A lot of it anecdotal. You, there are no big studies of like professionals doing drugs because nobody will tell you. So I had to use a very 21st century research methods. I posted queries on two um, big forums. One is Hacker News, which is for technologists, people in the hard sciences, some lawyers, a lot of finance people, and doctors, and the other was a site called toplawschools.com, which is for more than just law students. There are forums for lawyers. And I posted on both of those forums saying, I don't want to judge you, I don't need your name, just tell me <clears throat> what you do and what you see around you in your profession. So on Hacker News, I got 600 responses in 10 hours. And then I got a bunch of notes saying, I would have responded, but you need to get an encrypted email, because they didn't trust posting on an anonymous forum. And on the legal uh, forum, I got about 75 responses, which is a lot for lawyers. And based on that and talking to lots of addiction psychiatrists and psychologists, I went and visited a whole bunch of high-end treatment centers around the country, and I got a sense of what was going on, and I wrote about that in the book. So um, tonight, I thought I would just do three very short readings. <clears throat> I'll set them up, and then after that, feel free to ask me any questions you want about anything in the book or anything about white collar drug abuse or Peter or me, <laughs> anything like that. So <clears throat> this first reading is from the prologue, and the prologue starts with that day when I went up to Peter's house in this beautiful beach community to try to take him to the hospital and finally get to the bottom of whatever it was that was making him sick. He'd had like this low-grade flu for a year, like he could not shake it. He had recently been diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease. And I looked up the symptoms and said, you're supposed to be gaining weight, you're losing it. And he said, you know, I just paid a fortune for this endocrinologist, I'm telling you, this is what I have, let's see if the medicine works. And I thought, okay, you know, could you have this disorder and not have one of the most, uh, one of the hallmark symptoms of it? But Peter was very smart and he was always, kind of the smartest guy in the room, and I believed that he probably knew best, and so I thought, okay. And it was probably in my best interest to believe him, because to believe that he was dying or that something else was going on was too frightening, frankly, for me to think about. We really relied on him. He was the economic engine of our family, and even though we were divorced, we were really, we were friends, and we were also really trying to be co-parents. So this is just a brief reading from the prologue. July 11th. 2015. I plug in the code to the gate at Peter's house, and the door swings open to an expansive rectangular backyard. The grass is mostly brown, the $20,000 fountain in the center no longer burbling, its white stones covered in algae. I go to the front door and put my key in the lock. It's made of heavy glass and makes a whooshing sound as it opens, like the door to an office building. There's a staircase immediately in front of me that leads down to the main floor, and to my right is the only room downstairs. It was intended to be a family or rec room and has a glass wall facing the yard. I always thought it would be a great place for a party. Now it's been converted to a bedroom for our daughter, Anna, who is home from college for the summer. She stays here at her dad's house a few nights a week. Down here she has more independence, as well as her own bathroom. Anna hasn't been here in two days. Neither has our son, Evan. I call out, Peter? No answer. No sound from upstairs. Peter, are you here? I climb the stairs to the main floor. It's perfectly quiet and still. I take a minute to look around. The house is an architectural trophy made of steel, wood, and glass, all sharp angles and sunlight. Through the window, I can just make out a white line of sea foam hitting the beach. I turn toward the kitchen. On the counter, immediately to my right, there is a large, nearly empty takeout soda, the kind you get at a convenience store, some candy wrappers, piles of work papers, an asthma inhalator. 
Peter has been sick for more than a year with some kind of ongoing low-grade flu, constantly exhausted and weak. He's lost 30 pounds, maybe more, since we split up five years ago. But in the last six months, it's gotten worse. My kids say he sleeps the whole weekend when they're here, forgets to grocery shop, never makes meals. He doesn't seem to be going into the office much. The last time Anna and Evan were here, two days ago, their dad could barely lift his head off the pillow. Evan tried to take him to the hospital, but Peter refused, got angry, and snapped at him. Then he vomited onto the bedroom floor, threw a washcloth over it, and went to bed. No one has been able to reach Peter since Thursday morning. I have come here to check on him, to make sure he's okay and take care of him if he isn't. I turn down the hallway where the bedrooms are located. Peter, I call again. Peter, I'm coming down the hall to your bedroom, okay? His bedroom is at the end of the hallway. Its door faces me and it's open, but I can't see anything except a corner of the bed and a cluttered night table. I walk past my son's bedroom with its one orange wall and Ikea bed, past Anna's old bedroom, one wall painted deep pink, and another wallpapered in a forest of black trees with little blackbirds resting on branches. Someone has cut out a silhouette of a rat and pasted it onto a branch. I am nearly at his door and start calling his name again in earnest. Peter? Peter? I can see into his room. I'm coming into your room, Peter. I'm here to check on you. The covers on his bed are drawn back and I can see the crumpled white sheets. There are a few tissues in the bed with spots of blood on them. I'm starting to shake badly as I walk into the bedroom. Peter isn't in the bed, so I turn toward the master bath. Then I see him, lying face up on the floor between the bathroom and the bedroom. I stand there, unable to really understand what I'm seeing. My mind is struggling to comprehend this. That's him? What's on his face? There's a cardboard box under his head like a pillow. I walk over and kneel down next to him. His right arm is bent at the elbow and resting on his chest, a gesture he often makes, even when he is standing up. He holds his arm that way when he's making a point, pressing his thumb and first two fingers together for emphasis. Our son does the same thing. I touch Peter's arms to shake him awake. They are stiff and hard to move. His fingernails are blue. I put my hand on his chest to try and feel his heart. I suddenly remember lying in our bed when we were married, spooning, my chest up against his back, especially when I was cold or couldn't sleep. I would listen for his heartbeat, so much slower and stronger than mine, and feel safe. Now I feel nothing. So this next reading takes place the weekend after a college counseling session for my son at his very posh private high school that Peter insisted my children go to. And so all the parents make all the meetings, and we are there, and Peter is not there. And I'm texting Peter, are you here? We're in the office. We're going to start in five minutes without you. And I don't know why I believed he would show up, because this has been happening over and over again. And my son is slinking down into his seat because he's mortified. And finally, Peter walks in, and he slams the door open, and he's 30 minutes late, and he says, I have Hashimoto's disease. And we're all like, okay, you know, and he explains a little bit, and then the college counselor is, you know, wrapping her fingers on the desk, like, you know, can we get on with this? I have other parents waiting. And so we finish the college counseling meeting, and in the car, I tell Peter, you know, you look like you're dying. And he laughs at me and says, no, 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 it's, it's the Hashimoto's, now it's going to get better. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe this is it. So this short scene happens that weekend, right after that meeting, three days later, it's the weekend, and my kids are up at his house for the weekend. Sorry, I turned to the wrong one too fast. <laughs> um, okay, oh wait, I'm sorry about this. Okay, sorry about that. All right. The weekend after our meeting with Evan's counselor was another one where Peter spent entire days in his bedroom. Anna and Evan left early and drove back to my house Sunday morning. They told me Peter left his room only to walk into the kitchen to a pan of brownies he had baked. He took one from the pan and walked back into his room without saying a word to either of them. Evan would have stopped going up there months ago, but Anna continues to want to be there. 
She's only home for the summer and wants some time with her dad while she's here. So Evan heads up to Peter's with her, the two of them believing each weekend their dad will start feeling better and start acting more like his old self. Monday night, I call Peter to ask why he was in his room all weekend. He sounds rushed and irritated when he answers, probably wishing he hadn't. The kids are upset, I say. They don't understand what is going on with you. They didn't see you all weekend. What's the point of wanting them up there if you're going to ignore them? I told them I was sick, he says, exhaling loudly. I left a brochure about Hashimoto's on the counter. You left a brochure on the counter? I repeat, making it a question as if that will transform the statement into something that makes sense. Look, if you need to rest because of this, why can't you just talk to the kids about it? They're worried, Peter. They love you. I hear him sigh. I love them too, he says. And then the phone is silent for several seconds. What do you want me to do, Eileen? Tell them I'm very sick? I feel my stomach drop and adrenaline kick in. My heart is suddenly beating fast. I thought Hashimoto's wasn't uncommon, wasn't serious. I lower my voice and say, gently, sensing an opening for some kind of confession. Are you? Are you very sick, Peter? The phone is silent again for a few seconds. Oh my God, I think. It's not just Hashimoto's. It is something else. Yes, he says more softly. I am. He isn't at home. I know because of the noises I hear behind him. Other voices, scraping chairs, music. What do you want me to do? He asks, not really looking for an answer, just exasperated. I'm not sure what exactly I want him to do. I want him to be healthy again, but I don't know how to get him there. If I had as much money as you do, I say, I'd check myself into the best clinic I could find and figure out what the hell was wrong with me. At that moment, more than any other, I am so close to the truth. I am millimeters from it. One changed word, clinic to rehab, and maybe the jig would have been up, the game over. Peter would realize I had finally found the last piece of this puzzle I've been trying to solve, the one depicting a needle and a spoon and an elasticized tourniquet. But I can't locate that last piece. It's right in front of me, but I can't see it. I'm trying, Eileen, he says, finally. I'm doing the best I can. He hangs up before I can say anything else. And now this last reading uh, takes place at Peter's house right after he died. So there was the day that I found him and the police came and there's a lot of activity and that's described in its own chapter later on in the book, telling the children and it's a horrible, monstrous scene. And the next day, I talked to a friend of mine's sister who's a trust and estates attorney, and she says, listen, he was dealing with drug dealers. You know, you need to go up to his house and take out anything of value, real or sentimental, that you want, because they could have the keys, they could come looking for drugs, like, you need to get that stuff. So we decide we'll go up, but I'm afraid to go up there with just my kids. So a friend of mine around the corner, uh, William, the husband of another good friend who is a lawyer, and who is very stoic, comes up with us so that um, I don't have to face it alone. And, and now we're up in Peter's house and it's barely 24 hours since he was there. The, everything is exactly the same, except that his body's not there. I have, bought, I have brought boxes and bags into which we can load items we wanna take today. Anna wants to go start in the master bedroom, but I don't want her to see the bathroom floor which I know is stained with blood and feces and vomit and urine, all in the vague outline of her father's body. But she is becoming frantic to get in there, to get as close to Peter as she can. So William says he will go in first to remove anything she shouldn't see. I start to walk in with him, but my body thinks Peter is in there. And for the first time in my life, I know what it means to have your knees buckle. It's as if my kneecaps changed from a solid to a liquid, the rubbery tendons and ligaments bowing outward. I don't fall as much as I crumple down. Mom, mom, Anna screams, thinking I am fainting. I'm okay, I'm okay, I say, but I don't go into the bedroom. William tells Anna it's okay to come in. She races to Peter's dresser, which sits below a window overlooking the backyard. Before I left yesterday, I pulled down the shades so that the neighbors, with a back porch that allows a clear view into this bedroom, can't see the disaster in here. 
From my perch in the hallway, I can see both the dresser and Anna. She is pulling shirts off the floor and out of drawers, putting each one to her face and inhaling to see which shirts still retain the smell of her father. Those are the precious ones, the ones she is jamming into empty bags and boxes. She buries her head in each piece of clothing, grabbing at anything Peter might have worn or touched. She wants everything, dirty or clean, on the floor, in the hamper, lying in a heap under the bed. She wants all of it, every scrap. She's like a starving person, desperate for whatever crumbs were left behind. Evan is in the living room and kitchen, wandering around opening cabinets and drawers as if seeing the house and its contents clearly for the first time. Anna tells him to come in and grab some clothes. No, that's okay, just take what you want, he says loudly from the living room. But Anna insists, no, Evan, come in and take some things for yourself. You're going to want to keep some of this. Evan ignores her. He is not going in there. So she grabs a few t-shirts for him. I already know he'll never wear any of it, that it will sit in a drawer or a box somewhere because it can't be thrown out, but it can't be worn either. William emerges with boxes full of things like expensive stereo speakers, notebooks, cameras, all kinds of electrical and USB cords, an iPad, and Peter's work bag. Inside the bag is $1,000 in cash, a pill bottle with no label, and an Advil bottle. Both bottles contain a variety of different colored and shaped pills. There are three slim silver tubes of scar cream, individually packaged alcohol wipes, and tiny clear plastic tubes I have never seen before. Later, I will learn they are plastic needle caps, presumably from hypodermic needles that were used at the office. There is a small spiral notebook with what looks like notations about daily injection times and dosages of tramadol, an opioid painkiller, and cocaine, a combination usually referred to as a speedball. Peter was able to organize himself to get drugs, but not anything else. Thank you. So, thank you. So if it's okay, I'd like to open it up to questions. If anybody would like to ask me anything, I have some extra notes of things I can... Oh, I, is there a microphone? Do I bring a microphone? Or? We've got two microphones I'm up sorry, here in front, if you don't mind uh, using the microphones. Thank you. Without being too personal, can the, be personal, the question is, what made you split? You and Peter. Oh, what made us split up? Yes. He had an affair. But, but we, had a, we had a miserable, like we were really unhappy. I just thought, I thought, you know, it was like the misery game. We would both kind of stick it out until the kids were grown. But, um, but then he wound up having a relationship with someone he'd gone to law school with, who was on the East Coast, so it was very convenient, because he had business trips. And, um, and, I, and I think the guilt finally got to him, and he told me. Um, and we both kind of were looking for a way to end it, but we had so much guilt about our kids, and it just, it'd been 20 years, and he worked all the time. So even though it was really hard, much harder than I thought it would be, um, it turned out to be, I think, better. It was better for me, I think it also allowed him to completely do the things he wanted to do that he couldn't do when he was married to me, like a lot of different substances and partying and things like that. I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but my um, son-in-law and my daughter are, um, he works for Citadel and he went to Princeton, very highly educated. My daughter is a PhD in mathematics and she's a professor. and. Um, it kind of sounds similar. Their yeah. lifestyle, they're 32. Then they haven't had children yet. Um, but I know that there's some tension about, you know, he works 60, 70 hours a week. It's this high, high pressure job. You know, you can lose your job any time type of thing. Um, so I don't, going back to the beginning of your story, um, I don't know what, I mean, you're a journalist. Right. Um, if you've always been that way, but... Um, so it's question is kind of like going back to the beginning. Is there anything that you could see looking back along the way that could help maybe have changed the outcome? 
You know, that's a good question I often ask myself. I mean, I used to think that if we'd both gotten some good counseling and medication, because <laughs> I think, <laughs> who can't benefit from that? But I think Peter was always kind of depressed. And in the beginning of our relationship, I kind of thought it was like sexy, like still waters run deep. But like 10 years of that, and you're like, oh my gosh, he's, he's, everything is glass half empty. And then, um, and I was a really anxious person, so I think, you know, that wasn't necessarily a great combination, but I think Peter was very melancholy. I think um, he was adopted, and he spent four months in foster care and wasn't held that much, and there's a lot of research that shows that's a really important time for a, a, the development of a human being. Like, uh, he... Um, and he, uh, he had some trauma that's not in the book, some sexual abuse as a young kid that I didn't find out about until we split up. He had so you know, put it behind him, but the person had died, and he was really happy about it, and that's when it came out. So I think he had a lot of underlying issues. But I will say, even with that, 17 years of constant stress, you know, there's plenty of research that shows that it does change the brain. It definitely changed him. He became bitter and angry and resentful and never felt like he was adequately compensated in any way, whether it was praise or money or gratitude for the work he was doing, for all that he was doing for everybody, including our family. I mean, my son once said, this is so sad, but he was about eight, because Peter was always kind of depressed and he would come home from work and just go to sleep. And he said, I feel bad for daddy because if it wasn't for us, he wouldn't be so sad. And I was like, you know, like we were the ball and chain. And, and I don't think Peter intended it, but that is, you know, like he just felt so beaten down by the career. And yet, he also got something from it. You know, like, you, like your, is it your sister, your brother-in-law? or is it My son-in-law. Your son-in-law. Um, you look too young to have a, <laughs> but, um, you know, like he's, there's a friend of mine that said, you don't keep slamming your hand in the car door if you're not getting something from it. Like all the hours and all that, it's still, he has a prestigious job at a, at a well-regarded company. You know, there is some ego gratification in that. And then if you're making a lot of money, that feeds it too. So it's hard to walk away from all of that, especially if your ego and your you're, you're defining yourself really, your definition of yourself is really tied up in yourself professionally. And I think for Peter, he liked impressing people by saying, yeah, I'm an IP partner at Wilson Sonsini. They're very well known on the West Coast. They did Google's IPO and Apple. They're... And people would be like, wow, you know, but was that wow worth, you know, never seeing us or the kids or missing all these, mm. or not having any outside life? You know, he was addicted to everything. He was addicted to to food and alcohol and porn and shopping and exercise. I mean, you know, everything to keep moving so he doesn't have to face the reality, which was that he was not happy with what he was doing, I think, or how he was living. And, you know, that's my, I'm being an armchair psychologist, but that's what I see. So, you know, I, I think it's a, I think the chronic stress really, really wreaks havoc on people. I don't know if that helps, but yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you. I read your book in two days. I thought it was a page turner. Mm -hmm. Thank but you. But other than just being a memoir and telling a story, you created suspense in the memoir, which I thought was, was very good. Thank which you. Which is something I usually don't read in memoirs. I mean either. I know. <laughs> but you created suspense, and I really enjoyed Thank that. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Probably a dumb question, no, but no I thing. wanted to know what, why was his head on a cardboard box? You know, you, uh, you know what, other people have asked that. I don't know why, but there's something about that detail. I found it so heartbreaking because I don't know what happened, if it was just there, but I thought, what if he pulled it over because he, he needed to lie down? It just made me so sad. It was like in the police report, they noted that there was a light on, and I thought, you know, was he thinking he would just go to sleep and, and, you know, get into bed and wake up or something? Or So I don't know why. There was a lot of... I think he must have been really sick, and he was opening up mail and just throwing stuff down because there were open Amazon boxes and there was open letters and mail everywhere, like somebody who's either too high or too sick to really focus on it. So it looked like he'd opened it and then thrown it down. So I think there was just a box there, but it, it looked like he might have grabbed it to lay his head down on it, so. 
It was such a bizarre thing. It was <laughs> I bizarre. I don't know why I find it heartbreaking, but yeah. <laughs> You're a remarkable reader. Oh, thank you. Wow. What a fascinating story. Oh, my God. Thank you. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate that we can't recognize the issue and help them before something catastrophic. I know. I hope. I hope we can start to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my son has a brain injury, and he was an alcoholic, and he fell on his head when he was so sick and going. Was he intoxicated when he fell? Pardon? Was he intoxicated? Is that why he fell? No, because oh, no. he was trying to withdraw. Oh my gosh! It's one extreme or the other. Goodness, right? you know, well, you're you, either yeah. overdose or you're trying to get away from it, and oh. you're so sick that you. How have, is he now? He has a severe brain injury. It's a, I'm sorry. A movement disorder, and it's, uh, he was a, in fact, he graduated from the Conservatory of Music here. Oh, my gosh. And uh, was quite talented, played music. He was in New York studying public engagement at the uh, new school when do you his know accident why he, happened. Do you know why he developed a drinking problem, or? Uh, well, he played music here in Kansas City. And the bars he played at paid him in alcohol. Oh, boy. And he was a teenager. Oh, Rather gosh. Rather than get, we need to support our musicians here in Kansas City. We have such. Yeah, that's not the way to pay them. Yeah, and, and so, and I told him, I said, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to, you're too young. You're going to get addicted. And he did. That's what you've been and, through. And then it's just, a, it's just so heartbreaking because they want to quit. They, you know, they see how it destroys their life. Right. And I'm sure the same thing. I think he wanted to quit. I think he just was oh, so yeah. far and in. And then he that's couldn't. when the, you either go off the deep end. Right. Or, exactly. I, I have to say, I have a niece and a nephew who are also alcoholics. Oh, my gosh. And uh, one of them is a physician and one is an attorney. So they're pretty functional. Oh, what functioning. happened is they had the addiction prior to graduating from law school or medical school. And the medical school actually uh, had, you know, they kept him on as a student, but they said, you got to take a year off and you're, you're going to have to, yeah, yeah, and you got to get clean. And he did. Oh, he did. Okay. He did. And, and, and my niece, uh, she went to rehab a few times. This was in college that she became. Okay. Uh, but then uh, she actually went back to law school, graduated as a valedictorian and is now a a successful attorney. So my question to watch her. Yeah. My question is, okay, here's two people, you know, we've got two stories here. Right. Uh, where it ended in disaster. Right. And then we have two stories where it actually happened before they became So the there might be a, there might be a genetic predisposition, you know, in the but family. But they seem to be they, able to overcome. And it. people so, can. Yeah, people So what can we do to get and she's I mean, they're honest about it. This is what happened. I think that's great. And also, you're aware of it. Been to AA. You know, yeah, that, no, that's what, they, that's what they should do. And also, she should yeah. remember that she needs to somehow build balance into her life. If work is taking over or she's feeling really overwhelmed, like, she should reach out to someone, yeah. But I, I think that we, we don't reach out to these... In, like you said, the humiliation of it. I oh, can't yeah. admit, even in an anonym, anonymous survey, that I'm an addict. Well, and lawyers and doctors, I mean, it's very hard to admit weakness or that you have this. Yeah, because you're the one that makes the decisions. You make, you're the one they come the to for the answers. That, yeah. Right. And Aww. so I don't know. I think we, we need compassion. So many times we write these people off like, well, you know. No, we, that's do your need, we need more compassion, I think. Yeah, and, and, overall and to be in this there country. to help them when we Yeah, can. well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I wish you and your niece and nephew <laughs> luck. And your son. I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, we all have, that's life, and we all experience those things. And that's true. We just have to move. That's tough, though, yeah. Onward. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can't wait to read you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm curious whether you were with Peter before he went to law school and whether you um, noticed that experience having, like, a, a big impact on his personality or mental health. Um, I'm a, a lawyer and can attest to uh, yeah. the profession is not great for Are you a health. lawyer too? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, yeah. And so then my, I guess, bigger question is, in your research, did you find anything positive that 
law schools or law firms were doing to help? I, I did. There, there, well, so I can tell you that um, I did notice the change. He became, I mean, he was not an upbeat guy, but he became really depressed in law school. He hated law school. It was overwhelming for him. And he, he was tired all the time, and he felt like if he was going to do it, he had to be number one. Like, because he was in his 30s, he just felt like, if I'm making this career switch and asking my wife to come with me and do all, you know, like, and he did, he did it. But he, he wouldn't even drive through New Hampshire again where he'd gone to law school. He just, he couldn't even bear it. And, and after that, it just didn't end. He just, he just couldn't turn it off. So I do think it had a negative effect on him. And there was certainly a lot of substance use, too, in um, law school. And I was working at Harvard Business School, so I had a huge commute from Concord, New Hampshire just because there was nothing to do in Concord, and I was like, I'm gonna work there. Um, so he would party, you know, it was like back in school, so they're doing lots of coke and smoking pot and drinking a ton, and you know, I don't know what other stimulants they were doing to stay up, but they needed to. So I think it start, started a little bit there, but in our marriage, I, I'm, that's not me, so he couldn't really, if he was doing it, I didn't know. So he certainly wasn't injecting. And, there ha and as to talk about law schools, they, have, they are trying to do some things. Well, there's the ABA started this lawyer well-being pledge, which is kind of, you know, they signed up. There's 176 signatories now. And they're law firms, they're corporate entities, they're law schools, government agencies. And, it, and um, here's what, so some firms have changed. Like Summer Associate, uh, which are these, like, when they bring law students on for the summer. It used to be this boozy, partying summer to woo the summer associates to take jobs the next year. And now a lot of firms are de-emphasizing alcohol of those events. Um, but I, I, will, I will say, oh yes, yeah, so I'm looking, I had some good information, which of course I'm not being very organized about. Um, and if you just bear with me. Uh, yeah, so, now, law, and law firms are now um, law.com, which is American Lawyer Magazine. Last year, they reported that more and more firms were hiring professionals to head up lawyer well-being efforts. They, they do have, like, there are some that have um, Kirkland & Ellis, which is a national firm. They, they hired in May their first firm-wide director of well-being. But, I mean, you have 11 firms out of 40 that law.com surveyed that have done anything really to help lawyers, like build in the morning meditation or, you know, mandate that uh, the male lawyers take their paternity leave or allow nobody to carry over vacation. You know, it would be great if law firms said, on Sundays, clients cannot call our lawyers. They won't be available. And they're, they're trying to, but I think the rub is that if you're going to charge a client $600 an hour, that client expects 24-7 access to you. And you're doing that to lawyers that are also starting families and, you know, and running households and have other obligations outside. And it's so, at some point, it's, it would be great if a law firm said, you know what, we're okay not making as much money as we were. We're going to charge a little less per hour and you're not going to be able to call our attorneys on weekends. So, but um, one thing is that the generation of lawyers that are in their late 20s and early 30s seem to be demanding a different kind of law firm experience. I remember when Peter was, um, there were summer associates in his office and I think they could not stand him. So he would complain because he used to like diet soda, diet coke. They would take his diet cokes and put them in the freezer at night and in the morning they'd put them in the fridge and when he'd open it up they'd explode. <laughs> And, I, and it was because they were like, he's a jerk. We don't want to be, you know, he'd be like, you're leaving at five, six o'clock on a Friday? Like, you know, who do you think you are? You know, and they were looking at him thinking, I don't want to be you, you know, so it's little steps, you know. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I actually have two things. Um, the first one I'll share is I worked for nearly four years at one of the top law firms here in Kansas City. Okay. And I was let go, thank God, in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> the legal industry, and I know every attorney I met said, we're not an industry. We're so different from every other business. <laughs> Bull manure. <laughs> you still want to make a profit? You're a business. I was the business analyst in the information technology department. And uh, so I knew nothing. Uh, what was interesting is that I was getting to know one of the female attorneys. And surprisingly and thankfully, this attorney is a lesbian. 
and she was the one, she was the wife who was having the children. And when I left, she was pregnant with the second one. However, as time went on, she paid less and less attention to me because I wasn't an attorney. And one time when there was a tornado warning for downtown Kansas City, that will give you some clues, we all had to go to the very bottom floor that we could, which I think was the sixth floor, or maybe it was the basement. I don't remember now. It was 2011 or so. There were other attorneys around. She wouldn't even say hello. Oh, my gosh. It's that bad. If you're not an attorney and you're around attorneys, unless you're paying them, you really don't exist. Same way with engineers, although I don't know if they have the high pressure. Yeah, I don't eat, I have, I mean, I think there's software engineers, but that's a different, yeah. Yes. That's a terrible experience. The other thing I will say is that I've made an um, avocation of studying child development. Oh. And what I learned from a psychologist is that the babies do not have language to tell us what those memories are. They know about it. They have it in their body. They just don't have the language. So your husband, who is not nurtured for those first four months, right. I don't care what profession he'd gone into, if he'd become president of the United States, yeah. he would have never been enough. Right, I agree Because he you. never got to deal with those feelings of anger and grief. I, I tend to agree. And what I've learned even through social work, how important early attachments are. And his mother once said to me in front of him, you know, Peter was never that affectionate. He wasn't affectionate. She used to always say when we first got him, which probably didn't help, instead of saying when he was a baby, she would say like he wasn't very affectionate. And she said, I think it's because he wasn't held much as an infant. And Peter would say, oh, my mother, the psychologist, you know, because she took one extension course at Cornell. She used to tell people she went to Cornell. And he was like, oh, God, you know, like, so. But you know what? I think she had a good point. I think he, he, had, he was pretty locked up. And why was she expecting the affection from him? She should have been the one that was overdoing it. I think she was affectionate. But also, that household was evangelical. And the idea was that it was kind of Mine like was God true. was first. And then everybody else. So here's a kid who's already got this. And then, and in his family, you know, you love God first, and then everybody else comes in. So I think it wasn't, it wasn't always a great fit for him. Well, the other thing is the legal industry, which I never finished that part, I'm sorry, is going through huge turmoil. They are. It was already going through it in 2010, where software scientists are able to figure out how to do some of the lower level attorney work that associates have been doing for years. They're now able to let computers do that. Right, right. And we've been graduating hundreds of thousands, too many attorneys in this country for I don't know how many years, at least 20 or 30. And so the difficulty of getting any job, let alone a prestigious one, right, is right. extremely challenging. So thankfully, although our daughter argues like an attorney, she is not the kind <laughs> of attorney. Thank you for your comment. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi. I was just wondering, do you think your children knew about his addiction at all? And, I mean, did he hide it all in the bedroom? But they probably suspected something, right? Well, I will tell you this. It's not in the book. But he did have a girlfriend who was a nurse who was using with him. I didn't know. So I think they were kind of grossed out by the whole relationship. So like two years before he died, she moved in with her five-year-old, who was also, and they both started injecting. And so my kids didn't know because they wouldn't go into the bedroom because, you know, they were teenagers and they were like, oh, it's so gross, the daddy's girlfriends, you know. Yeah. So, and also Peter was a very powerful, like, I had no privacy. I don't know if that's mothers versus fathers, but he was a powerful father too. And so it was sort of like, you don't go into his room. If that door is locked, you don't mess around. You know, if my door is locked, you just keep, <laughs> you know. So I think they, did, they didn't snoop around. They really, you know, I think what is the saddest is that my, um, my son felt like his father loved his sister more because he said, ever since she left for college, he's just never home now. He doesn't spend any time with me. He didn't realize that his drug use had so escalated. So actually, that was their impression, was that somehow 
Peter did not love them that much anymore. That maybe he loved his girlfriend more or the, or the pet mouse more, you know, but really he was, he was just really sick. She wasn't there at the end then? So that's interesting. She let, I did, didn't write about her because I, I don't want to ruin her life. And, I mean, she has to live with what she did, but about a month, about three weeks before he died, she left and took her daughter to Paris for a month. And I think she knew, I mean, he was so sick. So I think she left because she didn't want to be criminally liable because the dealers were, a lot of them were her friends. She was a lot younger um, and she really liked to party. I don't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think they, they, I know a lot of people ask that. They really didn't. They were stunned. They just thought like daddy would never, you know. Yeah. Thank you for asking though. Yes. I have two questions. How did your children react to the book? And the second question is, what do you hope to do with your master's in social work? Oh, such a nice question. Well, my children, I think the, the harder thing for my children was the piece in the New York Times um, that had pictures in it, which I was convinced would be good to put in to humanize Peter. If I could do it again, I might not do it. it was, my daughter said it was fine, but I think when she saw it, she was 20, it was really hard for her. There's a letter in the New York Times that she wrote to Peter, dear dad, you know, you're the best dad in the world. And, you know, we had talked about putting it in the paper and she was like, I'm good with it. And then when it came out, she was like, oh my God, this is really messing me up, you know? So, um, so since that got so much traction, the book, I think, was less harrowing. They did read, they both read it. And we kind of decided as a family that, you know, I needed to process it. And I felt like I was getting sick from not telling the truth. And also I knew there were more people than me that were suffering than our family. And so... I felt like, so then what happens? Peter dies. I mean, the next year, that firm had the most profitable year, year ever. And it was like he never existed and none of it meant anything. And I, I just thought like, that's it. So dad dies, everybody gets paid off and, you know, and we all go away, you know, and, that, and it just felt like, no, there needed to be a consequence. We needed to talk about it and say like, look what happened to this law firm. Look what's happening in the U.S. Look what happened to our family. So they were really on board with that, with trying to make some meaning out of it. And, um, and they've, been, they've been really good about it. My daughter and I are also in counseling together, which helps. <laughs> so, which, because the book stirs the pot, so it's an ability to process stuff. And my son is like, he was very into like, telling the truth and maybe helping other people. So, and with social work, I had thought after finding Peter's body, it looked like such a lonely, painful death. I don't know if it was, but it just, you didn't get the sense that it was peaceful in any sense and that he was probably so sick that I had a lot of guilt personally that I hadn't seen it, that you know, this man is ostensibly killing himself in front of all of us and we didn't see it. And I felt like, you know, why didn't I see it? I was the adult. So I think part of that led me to think, maybe I'll work in end-of-life care. And, um, and so I started that, right. I wound up my, in field work, in social work, you have two years of field work. So my first year was at a clinic in the Bronx for people with HIV, addiction, and mental health issues. And I was like, just not addiction, you know. And that, but I actually loved it. And I really liked working, they were very poor, and um, I really liked working with people that were struggling with addiction because the stories underneath it were very complex and interesting. And now I work in oncology social work this year with cancer, which is really hard. So I'm not sure. I'm still kind of interested in end of life, but I'm sort of, I guess I'll wait and see. If you have any suggestions, let me know. <laughs> I'll mute it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, Eileen. This was just fascinating. Thank you so much for being here, for the great questions. I really appreciate it.